listening to Transformation in Trials. Welcome to Transformation in Trials. This is a podcast exploring all things transformational in clinical trials. Nothing is off limits on the show, and we will have guests from the whole spectrum of the clinical trials community. And we're your hosts, Ivana and Sam. Welcome to another episode of Transformation in Trials. Today, we have Alexander Gray, the Chief Medical Officer of Idea Pharma with us. Thank you for having me. And we are going to dive into the topic of uh, the state for drug innovation in life sciences. So first of all, I would like to ask you, what are some of your general observations about the states of innovation in pharmaceutical research? Yeah, for sure. I I would say that it's uh, like many of the trends in the industry, it's sporadic. Either there are some people who have been doing a lot of work in that space and there are others who are following more traditional paths. There's certainly heightened interest uh, given the, you know, the rising cost and complexity of running these trials, of trying to find solutions to get things done with smaller sample sizes and, and quicker as well uh, to, to reduce those pressures on the industry. Um, and there's other influences on this from the regulator, for example, about the demands that they are placing on those trials. And we're, we're seeing some shifts in those areas, which, which actually may hinder some of that innovation. So there's, there's different forces bearing down on people's programs, I would say, um, which, which makes life interesting for us. Now, one of the things we spoke about when we were planning this episode was this topic of setting your target indication for a specific drug. Can you maybe take us through how early is that target set and what are the implications of this for innovation? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. I, I, I think you have to go all the way back into preclinical development because a lot of the assets that we're working on, and you know, some of it does depend on the therapeutic area. Obviously, if you're working on a you know, single very rare genetic disease, for example, that the, the target may be very obvious. But certainly if you think of some of the big areas that a lot of the industry is working on, cancer, immunology, CNS actually as well, there are multiple different potential uses for a lot of the assets that are being developed. So whether you know they could go across multiple tumor types, multiple lines, for example, same with immunology, different autoimmune, autoinflammatory disorders. What's happening in preclinical research is that they're often already making decisions about the areas that they would prefer to operate in. So R and D is effectively driving that 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 view, uh, and that of course can be a good thing or a bad thing. But it, it it could absolutely be that they are narrowing down the field because of financial constraints, because of internal expertise about about what's uh, possible at that juncture. When the, the asset gets uh, kicked over to the boundary uh, into man and the team at that point, the clinical development team and hopefully in concert with their commercial colleagues thinking about where they could go, they may already have some quite clear narrowing of the field on the basis of the decisions that people have made back in preclinical development about what to look at. So, for, you know, I mentioned about Inflammatory disease, for example, they might have, I don't know, centered their program on looking on uh, Crohn's disease um, because they've got particular expertise in that. They were interested in that, so that's what they did. But there may be other places that the molecule is potentially as good or even better that they didn't look at. So when we're considering what to do next, it can be quite hard because if there's a lack of preclinical evidence or, you know, um, absence of evidence rather than evidence of absence, as it were, um, but that's going to narrow and restrict the opportunity that, that, that they're going to have because you know t- the clock is always ticking and it's hard for them to say, well, we'd rather do Crohn's, but you'd have to go back and do some more you know, bench work, lab work to ascertain the viability there. Uh, and of course, this you know, does need a very joined up strategy between R&D and the clinical uh, guys to make sure that we're all rowing in the same direction about what the company's trying to achieve within these large disease spaces. And monolithic, large monolithic companies may be less joined up in their thinking uh, in that regard. I mean, they may be in entirely different countries, (laughs) those two departments. 
smaller buyer techs tend to be much more joined up, of course, because they probably just have to go down the corridor just have the same, have the same conversation. Um, but it's very interesting if you look at the decision making as a driver here, rather than we always have this mantra in our company about, you know, it's not just about the molecule. It's very easy to believe that you can have better and worse molecules, but a lot of it really is down to the decisioning. And it's very, very interesting in different companies when they're making those decisions, how strategically aligned they are across the business um, to, to, to drive things forward. And better aligned ones tend to be more open-minded about the possibilities of where they could go or they've got joined up thinking across those boundaries. Is the solution that we should be spending more time in preclinical then, Alex, to explore the possibilities or is it not as simple as that? I think that would be a great starting point. I mean, there's always financial constraints, and I think that that's an interesting question. Certainly, when I speak to preclinical scientists and ask them why they did what they did, that's usually the answer: is that their boss said that this is what we're doing, <laughs> and then financial reasons. I mean, which is fair enough, right? It's understandable. It's an expensive business, um, but I do think it puts constraints that can be problematic as you go forwards. I, I think also those conversations across the boundaries and I've, you know, as I said, I've seen better and worse in companies in terms of that kind of dialogue uh, about, you know, that strategic alignment. So I think that matters a huge amount because there's definitely a risk of developing stuff against disease targets that are less interesting to the business overall. Um, and also, I'm going to give you a good example in inflammatory science where there are some small orphan indications and that the preclinical team are very excited about those rightly because they may be adding significant value to a small pool of patients where they're very difficult to treat but from a business perspective that's really only a way of launching into the market versus what might be sitting behind it so too much focus on the launch piece can diminish the wider opportunity of where they could go um, and given the high r d costs it's that may not be the optimal way to consider things yeah and uh, picking up on something you said on one of the early responses i, I noticed you used the uh term of phrase hopefully speaking to the commercial colleagues so i'm guessing that doesn't always happen well it's been i, I think it's been a really interesting journey in the 25 years that i've been been doing all of this about what kind of commercial input and dialogue is is happening and i think we've we moved some years ago to having early commercial input in early the early clinical phase, you know, even back into phase one, more commonly on the cusp of phase two and then onwards. And that's been withdrawn and then put back in. And it's still, I guess it's the same thing people always say. It's the same with politics, don't they? It's kind of like this pendulum swing over time. And I've seen that that go on. So I think they rightly recognised 15 years ago there was a need to do some of that. But then I've seen whole departments disbanded and then reformed in that 15-year <laughs> period. Um, I think that the joined up R&D to commercial thinking, I think is happening more, which is, you know, those basic conversations about what are we really trying to get at here uh, and making sure the pipeline is aligned with clinical unmet needs so that we're solving problems for patients, physicians, healthcare systems at the other end, and that we're not just doing great bench work but with you know that's that's rudderless i think there's a lot more of that for sure uh going on so i think that that's good news mm -hmm. um but the kind of level of commercial input you see in the early phases where you still often have got a lot of options of where you can go next that's i would say still quite variable between organizations and some mm -hmm. companies do a much better job of that than others but. got it and this, this might already happen, but what I was thinking about in my uh, head when you were speaking then was, look, if there's an indication that becomes apparent preclinical that's worth exploring in the clinic, but it's not aligned with a particular pharma, the, 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 far, the pharma company that's doing that R&D work, if it's not aligned with their uh, pipeline and strategy, therapeutic area strategy, are there options to kind of license that to somebody that that perhaps does have a requirement or a focus on rare disease to use that as a point of uh, example? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think, again, I think the companies are variable in their open-mindedness about that. In other words, I think you're quite right. Sometimes you can see a moniker. I remember there's one in the oncology I worked for where they spend a lot of time looking at its 
potential value in, in lung cancer. And the reason they did that was they had a business unit in lung cancer. And the drug was actually much better suited to bladder cancer because it was targeting a particular mutation, which has a very high frequency in bladder cancer. But it took them several years to really get to the point of saying, which is this is the wrong plan for this thing. So those sort of, if you like, strategic constraint that the organization had placed on it, you know, we need a lung cancer drug. I think got in the way of the thinking. And when they finally realized that they're better off being serendipitous, if you like, we've got a great drug, we just need to go where it's going to take us, that, that things changed. But equally, you can absolutely see. And by the way, I think this is this can be really interesting in biotechs because often they're formed by people who've got a very particular strand of thinking within a therapeutic area. So you see, I don't know, four urologists get together and build a biotech. So they can be quite myopic about what they've got in their hands, as opposed to saying, well, we've got to take a step back from this and say we may, we may believe that our job here is to produce drugs in urology, but what happens if this thing is great in lung cancer? You know, it's the inverse of what I've just said, and, and why don't we look at that? Um, but I think you're absolutely right to say that sometimes the, the this idea of what strategic means in that context, you know, what's the the umbrella, if you like, that sits above it? Mm -hmm. It can be a help, but it can also be a set of constraints as well that are not, not useful in the thinking rather than saying, let's go where the asset takes us. It's going to define itself in some ways, right? Got it. No, I, I think it's interesting. And say for argument's sake, a biotech or pharma company moves forward with an asset that uh, that is based around a specific indication um, that has been derived during preclinical work. It goes into the clinic. Are all opportunities lost then to start looking at other indications for that molecule, or are there still opportunities to to do some experimentation work and see if there are um, additional indications that could be uh, made available to um, for or for that molecule to 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 obviously help uh, i mean yes i absolutely think there are i mean i mean in, in some ways if you talk about something like cancer where obviously there's yeah. a huge amount of time and effort in the industry and and um, you know the the risk reward profile for them developing is, is you know would be considered highly favorable so significant risk but significant reward for sure at the other end if you get it get it right in some ways it's easier because you can test multiple models in preclinical so that's that thing about you know did they look at bladder cancer models in their preclinical i mean actually i don't know whether they did or didn't i don't think they probably did but and they went back and did that work to allow them to move forwards but it's not uncommon for them to say okay we will look at how this performs against a molecular target in a range of tumors because they can in in vivo and in, in vitro so when they do go into to phase one which of course in cancer is going into patients as opposed to healthy volunteers they're often going into basket trials anyway where they, they will look at a range of things that it might be able to to do i think thereafter it gets a bit more complicated actually about where you go next and the costs of different development paths but then in some other therapeutic areas it's, it's interesting because you may have a target that could actually have quite diverse applicability across different therapeutic areas yeah and then actually that's where you see the most siloing going on because if the, if the company says well you know it may have some cardiovascular applications we don't do cv we don't get out of bed for that it's incredibly hard to, for them to do anything with that and as you say there might be out licensing or, or collaborative arrangements that may be possible but often those things will sit on the shelf for the other things that they could have done because the company just doesn't do that, um, even if it's got applicability. So some of the big companies, I mean, I worked on one about 18 months ago where actually it, it really spans hepatology, respiratory medicine, cardiovascular, it had very broad, which is quite rare, <laughs> that they're like that, but it did. But because they're a big company, they were able to go to the different silos and ask the questions of, you know, we gave you this and, do you, do you how would you develop this and where could you go in very very different disease states but it required a top five pharma company with their scale and breadth of, of, of therapeutic areas to do that smaller companies i think would they wouldn't have asked those same questions at that point but is it correctly understood then that we have all these potential drugs that are in phase two or maybe just approaching 
phase three that may not work for the indication we thought they would work for, but may work for something else? And is there are there any efforts to try and uh, and mine some of those some of that research and apply it to useful indications? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I mean, that's what we spend all of our lives looking at. Actually, is that you know? So let let's get away from cancer, where obviously phase one is going to be impatience, and and we'll go to somewhere where phase one is going to be you know safety and the more, you know, the, the more traditional route, you know, common common route uh, through. And then the question is, you said what? could you do next and i think that the industry for a long time has looked at phase two as a way of running small phase three trials effectively which is we need to have a signal that's very specific for the place that we're planning on ending up rather than saying what hypotheses plural could we test at that point to understand what this thing does what it might be capable of but also in whom so that obviously the drive towards more precision therapeutics has had a couple of strands one was being more precise about hitting targets with less off target stuff so we've got less toxicity that's great and we've made huge progress in that that regard the other one is precise in, in terms of the kind of people that we're treating so that there's this quote back from the i think 1990s by the then head of GSK and R&D where he said at a press conference most of our drugs don't work in most of our patients uh and actually he left the company shortly afterwards i don't know whether those two things were related but of course it was a very honest admission that actually the job description isn't to find out whether it works it's to find out in whom it works because a lot of these diseases are heterogeneous and you may work in 20 percent or 50 percent or so i think all that needs exploration at, at phase two or can be explored you need enough power in your trials to go and and really dig deeply at, at, at that and if you want trying to parallel it into other disease areas the question is how can you do that efficiently but when we talk about you know the type of the, 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 the conversations today i think you know what can you do that's innovative in that space i think looking at surrogates and trying to get signals that could then have broader applicability going forward so you, you're not just you know narrowing very heavily into that smaller phase three approach you're saying okay let's try and generate a range of signals and a range of patients and then we can choose where we go next on the basis of what we see what's clinically interesting what's commercially interesting um and look a lot of work's been done in cancer with that because a lot of mechanisms in immuno-oncology are not going to work in everybody so there's a need to head down a biomarker based route typically i mean it could be phenotypic as well as genotypic but the genotypic route is obviously very favored if we can get a test that will find the patients where it really is effective that's driven a desire a desire to do that and structure the trials in a way that we do really go looking for who in whom it works but there are also good examples actually of where even in relatively recent times, people haven't applied that kind of rigor on the way through. They're trying to do smaller trials just to say, does it work? And then you end up in that sort of gray zone where you see something, but it's not very convincing. And then you're like, well, where, where do we go next with this? It's probably not good enough in a broad population, but we haven't done enough diligence to really know where it can work. Um, and certainly in CNS, where I also do a lot of work, I think that's absolutely critical because there are very few mechanisms that can have universal applicability in cns and if you don't do that work you're tending to end up with very marginal benefits in broad populations and for a lot of reasons that's not good news it's not good news for patients it's not good news for payers either they don't want to pay for small benefits in large populations yeah. and that's an area i think we've got to get better at which is, is trying to dissect out those benefit profiles and the patients they're applicable to in, in that phase of, of development alex do you ever find that these secondary indications ever come to light at the point post uh, approval um if that's the right terminology so the drug's been approved and then general population is taking the drug or being prescribed the drug for whatever indication that might may may be and then uh, a as a result of that, a secondary benefit or indication comes to, to light or to purely from the, the scale of the number of people that have been administered the, the drug in this particular example. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, actually, I think CNS, I mean, psychiatry in particular is a great example of this. I mean, if you look at the sales of things like antipsychotics, most of the sales come from off-label indications. Mm. So actually the, the physicians are, if I say experimenting, I think that's perhaps a bit harsh, but they're looking at the profile and saying, oh, I think that could be applicable to a particular cluster of patients that, that I see in clinical practice, sometimes on the basis of the efficacy profile, sometimes on the basis of side effects as well, actually, or, you know, give you a good example. If you give antipsychotics to depressed patients, they can make them drowsy, but if you give them in the evening, that can be great if insomnia is a big part of their problems. There's a lot of that sort of segmentation, if you like, going on in, in, in practice. And as you say, you may be deriving signals from the post-marketing surveillance that, that point you in other directions um, within disease states and into other disease states that you haven't uh, looked at as part of your, your trials program. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, the question of whether they could have done that earlier and how much it matters to them to get formal labels in those spaces. I mean, I'm not encouraging people to use drugs off label, but I, I certainly think that, that companies could do more to, to look earlier. I think a lot of this is risk aversion, of course, cost. I mean, if you are running those phase twos as a scaled down version of your phase three, it could be obviously extremely expensive to run lots of those things in parallel or staggered. But the big risk, I think, to them developmentally is they run something, they don't see what they want to see, and then they've got no options. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're, they're done. They're, you know, they have to go upstairs again and say, well, kind of didn't work out. We we think it has got promise, but we don't know where because we've you know we, we've hit a brick wall at this point, and it's quite straightforward, isn't it? If you've got no options, you've got you know there's no choice. <laughs> what you can do next? If people do start to see those signals, does it then have to go through back to phase one, phase two, and follow that well trodden pathway for uh, the the, it, the drug or asset would have had to have taken for the initial uh, approval process, or are there mechanisms to maybe fast track that? Because I don't know, safety's been proven already, for example. Or, yeah, curious about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, some of it's a numbers game, which is you know how many people did you put in? You know, would it satisfy the regulator that you do have enough safety? I mean, it's been interesting in oncology actually even in recent months, I think there's been increasing pressure uh, f from the regulators about people moving very rapidly through development phases and then exposing large populations, relatively large populations of patients to drugs that have had very minimal exposure in early phase. And they're really starting to clamp down on this a lot actually. Uh, and there were a lot of murmurings a few years ago about it, but it, it, it's gained a lot of pace. So I think that going back to the, the fundamentals of what the regulator feels they're there to do you know this, the thing around safety i think matters an awful lot i think the trick of whether you can run good basket trials to try and tease out more you know back to the you know in whom it's operating which tumors in that case it, it's operating well in build a good safety database yes but then also provide yourself with multiple directions of where you can go next and in some ways, I think in oncology, as I say, it's it, it's easier in the sense you can basket things, you know, in late line cancer, it's a doable proposition. I think where it's getting interesting is some other disease areas that you might be able to parallel into. And, you know, my trip at the weekend to the ECMP, a lot of it was about that, what they call transdiagnostic approaches, which is saying if we think it's very good at affecting, I don't know, anxiety, we could run a phase two trial in patients with generalized anxiety disorder, or we could say, let's find patients who've got anxiety across a range of psychiatric conditions and then run the trials like that. So it's going horizontally rather than vertically or vice versa. Um, and that then gives us a, a set of signals of what the drug is capable of that allows multiple paths forward. So rather than go, having to go backwards, you can just pick where you could go next but you've got more shots on goal earlier from, from doing that. And, and I personally think that's where we need to go is generate more hypotheses earlier. It just may, it might cost more. I mean, that that's definitely a risk of, of doing that. You may have to invest at a point where people are more reluctant to do that. But I think if you look at the flow through of that from a business perspective, relative to successes, because I mean, that's a big problem, obviously CNS 5% 
survival rate between phase one and launch. If it moves that needle upwards from 5%, it probably doesn't have to do it very much to justify what I've just described, because even getting to seven or eight percent may be enough to move the business needle in that 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 direction. Yeah, no, I think it's fascinating. I I even had something appear on one of my um, social media news feeds at the weekend that reminded me we had this recording uh, this week that looked, that talked about. It was a GLP one that um, had recently been approved. Uh, I think the indicate it was either obesity or type two diabetes or both maybe, but they'd started to see a secondary um, uh, effect of it uh, helping to improve addiction. So yeah, I think there seems to be some kind of big link between brain and uh, other um, indications, particularly. Uh, Digest, digestive tract indications is what I've heard as well. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, I think that's especially interesting. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of interest in that field. There's a drug sitting in phase three that Nova Nordisk has that they're, they're running Alzheimer's trials as a uh, disease modifier. And they literally went straight into phase three uh, based on epidemiologic evidence. So they looked to your point about the post-marketing thing. What you could see there was that there were lower rates of dementia in the patients who've been treated with these drugs and they took a punt and they've gone straight through they were able to do that of course because they've got labels in uh, other areas where there have been very large patient exposure the drug is very well tolerated so you're not exposing people to risk by by, by doing it i mean high risk i mean there's obviously always risks but um now whether that'll pay off is a very interesting question there's lots of reasons why epi data can be wrong um but actually i think that's kind of bold strategy and that's a great example of taking a mechanism and paralleling as you say into a totally different disease space and if you look at them as a company they don't have any presence within cns it's not what they do for a living at all i mean they're obviously steeped in diabetes as an organization and have been for decades um and and actually it's interesting with that is the effect metabolic is it I mean, there's, is it inflammatory? There's all sorts of hypotheses about this. But in many ways, does it really matter how it works as opposed to whether it works? Um, but that's a good example, I think, of the company taking a strong leap forward at risk. And it's interesting if you, you know, the CEO has been interviewed about it in the public domain, but he said, oh, look, we're very well aware that the chances of success here are quite modest. But obviously, if it does work in an area that's got huge unmet need, or mechanism of action as well, pricing that's sitting in a totally different place than giving them Agihelm or, you know, a, a monoclonal. This is a very interesting proposition, right? Um, and that's all born out of a hypothesis, as you say, generated from post-marketing data, not, not from the, the bench. Um, nice. No, and you, you uh, clearly speak... Um from a position of being pretty informed on this topic alex could you give us a bit of background on what well, your background if you like and uh what, what you're currently working on at the moment yeah for sure so i i uh i trained as a physician many years ago uh and in immunology and i worked in clinical practice for a bit uh and then went into industry but on the service side uh and i actually originally started out in communication and then got much much more interested in strategy and uh path to market strategy which is what our company specializes in looking at stuff in early phase development and looking at that optionality of where we can go and weighing up pros and cons of different different directions that that, that we could take and i guess one of the beautiful things about doing consultancy is that you get to work on a huge breadth of stuff and i genuinely think that's extremely useful because you see things in certain disease areas and then you can ask those parallel questions of how could i incorporate that elsewhere take your learnings forward and really drive them into other areas and it's a very interesting thing with drug development because all of the people of course are very very highly specialized particularly on the medical front so if you're an ex-oncologist who goes to work for a pharma company you will just plow that furrow relentlessly which is great you're bringing huge expertise into the area but you don't you haven't seen anything in CNS in your entire career that you might parallel in, for example. So I think the beauty of, of being on the outside is that you can genuinely look and see how you can innovate in a big picture level across different therapeutic areas. Um, 
So we, we, I mean, our company does a lot of work in that space, and it's not just looking purely at clinical development paths. It's looking at the commercial implications, and we're increasingly spending our time in what you'd call decision science, really, which is understanding how people make these decisions. And back to my, you know, five percent to eight percent, or, or whatever the figures I used, understanding where those crunch points are that you may be able to, you know, move the move the needle through different decision processes. And it was really born out of an observation many years ago that if you gave the same molecule to two different companies, would it end up in the same place? And we all knew that that's clearly not true, (laughs) that that we know that it wouldn't end up in the same place. So the question is why? And of course, it goes back to that basic observation. It isn't just about the molecule. It's all the decisioning on the way through that's driving where it ended up and how quickly it got there. And how much money it made it the other, all of those those things and so we started building case studies out of that and understanding the kind of decisioning that people had and what drove better and worse outcomes and that's not trying to pretend we can answer all the questions but it, it allows us to just look at how you can move that needle in a way rationally saying there are better decision making processes here and it isn't just all about the asset you've been given Cool. So you're having cups of coffee with lots of people in these organisations then by the sounds of it, commercial through to research, preclinical teams and everything in between. Yeah, and actually I like nothing better than going back to the preclinical guys because I think you usually find out a lot about what they think this, (laughs) what the molecule is and what it could do. And it's amazing how often that gets lost in the mix. So when you go and speak to the guys who are trying to struggle their way through phase two with it, That, that thread of why why they did any of this in the first place, what they think it could do is has, has somewhat been lost in the mechanics. And I think it's honestly it's a great basic observation if you think of what's going on at that transition. After we've got some safety days, so we're, we're, we're clear we've got something we can move forward with in in in, in man or you know into phase one. But the clock is really ticking, and there's usually resource constraints and timetables here, lots of Gantt charts. And if you go to them and say, look, could you just pause a little bit? Maybe we need to think a bit more about what we could do here. That That's a quite anachronistic thing for, for, for companies to do. It may be the best thing, you know, decisive hesitation may be the best thing you could do. Um, but it's about changing mindsets, about that decision paradigm to say, look, do you really think running headlong towards that phase two design that you're already talking to some investigators about? is the right thing to do versus saying, could we take a step back and ask what this thing really could do and then look at different ways we can move it forwards because you're about to make a critical decision here. And once we've gone down one road, turning back is really, really hard. It's very rare. So as I said, you know, you're either going to get to a cul-de-sac where you've not found what you wanted and then you're like, where do we go next? If you're lucky, it'll work and, and, and you'll go forward. But even then, you could have missed all sorts of other things. It could also do because you haven't looked um, or asked those questions. This might be a slightly left field question, Alex, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, does the way that trials are changing from an operational standpoint in terms of this big focus on decentralizing um, the nature of the trial and how, uh, how the patient doesn't necessarily have to go to site for all of their visit. Well, doesn't have to go to site as often and therefore the nature in which the data is collected, but also maybe some of the uh, treatment is administered. Does that mm-hmm. influence the science at all or or, or not really? Because I was just thinking about that and as you were talking there, there's a massive shift in, well, there's a lot of innovation going on in science, but there's also a lot of innovation going on as to how clinical trials are actually conducted is there any kind of uh, conflict or even synergies there? No, it's a great question. I mean, obviously, COVID's had a massive influence on accelerating that stuff for, for very practical reasons. Uh, I mean, I, you know, the industry was driving down that route already. Some of it's about cost, clearly. Um, but some of it's also about, frankly, better data collection. I think a lot of the digital techniques is recognising that, you know, looking at standard endpoints at fixed time points in a trial is frankly a little bit out of date. It's not a great way of getting outcomes. I mean, obviously I'm not talking about, you know, cancer, for example, where 
we're looking at survival, for example, you know, nice simple binary endpoint, alive or, or dead, sadly, from the patient. But a lot of stuff in, in you know, neuropsychiatry, I mean, where we're doing a lot of work is fascinating, but a, a lot of um, ecological momentary assessment work, that has to be done offline anyway. You, you don't want to do that at a visit. It needs to be collected through digital techniques. That also opens up a lot of other vistas of what you may be able to gather as data and if you, you think of a lot of these drugs in psychiatry, what they're actually going to do to the patient, the kind of symptoms that it might be alleviated, the impact it has on their functionality, quality of life, relationships, I mean, all sorts of stuff that you could record that we didn't used to record or we did it very badly through some paper-based questionnaires. It's opened up new vistas. So a lot of the stuff I, I was mentioning about, um, uh, you know, trying to do more in phase two and ask more questions. These kind of techniques have allowed us to explore more hypotheses in a way that would have been hard uh, before. And also to do things like chucking digital therapeutics. Um, so again, actually the meeting I was at over the weekend, there's a trial running in patients with schizophrenia where they're putting the drug in, but they're also putting in cognitive remedial therapy using a digital tool. And obviously this can then be administered day in, day out at home, uh, you know, on a device or, or, or whatever. So that's opened up really totally new vistas in our ability to apply the therapeutics as well as measure the outcomes as well. Um, the other thing, I mean, I know there's obviously there's all the basic stuff going on in compliance and, you know, you can video people swallowing their tablets and this kind of thing. And, I've, you know, I, I regularly go to sessions where all of that's discussed. I mean, that's really important important because drugs can't work if people don't take them and actually upping the game there in terms of adherence rates in trials has is, is been a rightly a big focus of effort what's amazing honestly in development people always assume that when we get into later phase development things are failing because they don't have efficacy occasionally they're failing because of toxicity that's absolutely not right. The proportion of the trials that are failing because of lack of recruitment or poor adherence, or it's, it's staggering, you know, the wastage there. So making sure that if we're going to run these things, that they run properly. <laughs> it may sound a very basic thing, but I, I think it's, I can't remember the statistic, there's something like 40, 50% of these late phase, tri late phase trials are failing at that, at that basic level, which is a staggering observation, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think... My, my kind of viewpoint is particularly uh, in these more personalized medicine type trials where the patient numbers are so small, uh, like every kind of data point matters, right? Because it's uh, one kind of operational mishap could skew the whole trial potentially. Yes. Yeah. No, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, we've obviously got better at things like weeding out sites that are performing poorly and I remember one I worked on in, in prostate disease where you have to measure prostate volume using a transrectal probe. And there was clearly one site where the probe was obviously broken <laughs> because all of the figures were just sort of off the scale. And you were like, well, either all these men have got really large prostates uh, or your probe isn't working properly. And it's probably the, the latter um, <laughs> that's going on there. But that sort of data cleaning as well. And you can use, I mean, nowadays you can use AI as well where you can look at more algorithmic things that are trying to tease it out and 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 some of the stuff that has uncovered you know dodgy dealings in data assessment has been on the ai basis where you can look for patterns of systematic you know problems yeah. or even manipulation in the data and make sure you clean it out which is clearly important for integrity and uh, as well as outcome uh, we always ask our guests one final question in the end if there was one thing you could change about our industry what would that be For me, it would be doing this, uh, you know, examination early in life cycle of understanding what possibility looks like. I think it's it, it's incredibly hard to get molecules through that can do stuff uh, safe enough and making sure we maximise what they can do, in whom they can do it, and that we're open to those possibilities. I think it's going to be you know, is, is becoming increasingly important in a very, very expensive, risky business. But if you want to up our success rates, uh, if you want to maximise the opportunities from individual molecules, that's what we need to be doing more of. We need to leverage all of the 
tools we've got our disposal we talked about digital things but you know bayesian statistical methodologies we need to really and that that actually has been remarkably slow to take off i mean there are people who've clearly been enthusiastic about doing it but if you look at the number of trials that are genuinely run statistically and are not you know in these, these novel ways it's remarkably small actually and i think that's an area that, that we need to just push and keep pushing out there are better ways to do this um and we need to break away from our more you know conservative roots in some of this and really be more exploratory and use that early phase to ask broader questions that then can point us in different directions and this may require more money as i said but i still think it's the right thing for the industry to do and that I think we'll see more and more of it going on, honestly. Perfect. Well, look, thanks very much, Alex, for your time today. Um, I'm sure uh, our listeners are going to want to know where they can get hold of you if they've got any additional questions on this topic or want to uh, find out a bit, a little bit more about the work that you're doing. So um, where's the best place for, for listeners to, to try and reach out to you? Yeah, come through our website, www.ideafarmer.com dot com that's the best way there's forms there's uh actually there's a lot of interesting stuff on there case studies and and articles that we've written on exactly these topics so that's a great starting point perfect thanks alex thank you very much you're listening to transformation in trials if you have a suggestion for a guest for our show reach out to Sam Parnell or Ivana Rosendale on LinkedIn. You can find more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or in any other player. Remember to subscribe and get the episodes hot off the editor.